Okay. So, um, I have different things planned for tonight. Just a little bit different than normal. Um, and I'll give a background. So, Um When I first read through Ram Khal's study the first time, I got to the spiritual realm and I kind of hit a, a roadblock, I guess. I have all these concepts. He talks about reward and punishment and the purpose of why we're here. And then you get to this chapter, which me, for my thinking, seemed pretty odd in the middle of all these different concepts is you encounter the spiritual realm. And it seemed like a huge switch. Gear, he's switching gears here and why at this point. So I was going to do just a bit of a background to give you a lead into why, um, in my in my opinion, he would put this section at this point. And as we've been going through, um, I just have some some notes of my own that I'm going to read, and then we'll get into the text with the help of Shem. So, um, just a bit of review to get us to one five, and I does have a point. I I kind of got. I don't want to say carried away, but I did, I have a synopsis, and I don't know if I, there's things that I wanted to cover, and I'm not sure if I covered them, so when I wrote them out, they're touching on points, I'm not sure if I brought up, and if I did, and beat, and covered them a nausea, my prop, my apologies, <laughs> so just to get started in, in just a moment, so, but again, thank you very much, everyone, for coming, and so I will just read some of my notes. <laughs> And if you have any questions or comments, please. Um, so I'm just going to go through the synopsis again. This is a this is just a book review. And if you have any questions or comments, please just you know raise your hand, and we'll be getting into that very soon. If I'm reading too fast, please just um, ask me to slow down. So beginning at the very beginning, um, some of the concepts are that we don't have any power to understand God, and therefore we have all these reasons that we don't possibly understand. We're starting at the point where we believe we have a belief in God, we have a faith in God that we believe there is a creator and that he exists. So this is the premise that all of these notes are built upon. So as the sages say, there's nothing positive we can say about God himself, only that he exists, but we can speak and understand of his relationship with his world. Because God is this infinite being, we can't even the words infinite it, um, without beginning, without end, are all concepts that are finite, limited perspectives, can't really wrap our minds around. So the only hope we have is to understand very minute aspects of God in his, in his nature. We can try to understand the world and why it exists. We can study what God himself has taught us about the purpose of creation through the Bible, through traditions, and through the study and observance of creation itself, and that's through science. Oh, you can't hear me? Okay. Um, through his relationship with the world, we understand that God is good, that he defines good, and that every act of God contains the most pure and infinite good that can exist, and that God that the goodness of God and his love work together to bring about his purpose in creation. God is good to all. His love rests on his deeds. And that's from Psalm 145, verse 9. Love, therefore, is a vehicle that Hashem uses to bring his goodness to the world. The, world, the word is actually chesed, which is kindness. It's the way that God channels his influence into this world. Creation is an expression of God's goodness. Because God is absolute perfection, he has no need for anything, and therefore his act of creating the world is the most perfect act of altruism and love possible. He didn't need us. He wants us. And Psalm 89 says, the world is built on love. And with an infinite world of love have I loved you, therefore I have drawn you to me with affection. And that's from Jeremiah 31. Um, any, everything that God does is good in this world due to its altered state since the fall of Adam. They may, there, there may be things in this world that seem to contradict this principle that God is good. There seems to be bad and evil, but ultimately, just as everything came from God, ultimate good, God's ultimate good, all things end up as good. Sorry, I'm having a hard time with my own writing. I wrote kind of fast. Every aspect of creation in our own lives as well is orchestrated by God for the ultimate good that God wishes to bestow upon his creation, namely us. 
God made everything for his purpose, even the wicked for the day of evil. And that's from Proverbs 16. I'm sorry, Proverbs 6, 4. And the Talmud Yoma states, everything that God created in his world, he created for his glory. And Isaiah 43 says, everything that is called by my name, for I have created, and I have created formed, and made it. The understanding is that when Hashem speaks of his glory, it means that it was for himself, for his own reasons. And that the comprehension of this is beyond our ability because God's actions, as they relate to us, um, we can call them good. But in relation to God himself, we can't understand. That's beyond our ability to understand. So when God relates to us, we, can, we have an ability to understand it. But for God's own purpose, the mind of God is unknowable to us. So we know God has a plan for creation, and that's to bestow the ultimate good. And this plan has, has a blueprint and how it is to be delivered. And um, that is called the Torah. And in Proverbs 4, 2 says, I have given you a good thing. Do not forsake my Torah. The Torah is the ultimate plan for good for this world. Mankind was made in a, a unique being in creation, formed to be the recipient of this good that Hashem wishes to bestow. And um, it's a really important concept which will come up later, and it's used throughout Scripture. It says, in a multitude of people is a king's glory. And that's Proverbs 14.8. And so, as a result of this, God, um, we are his people, and this, this kingship is a really important concept that will come up again. So I'll continue reading my notes. Um, one can say that for us to receive the good that we must choose it, choose a relationship with Hashem. It is for this purpose that Hashem has created free will. We are free to choose the good and shun the evil. We bear responsibility for our actions and full credit for our good works. Free will is the most essential ingredient in creation in regards to giving us a chance to come close to God. This closeness is not physical, it's spiritual. This is mirrored in our own lives. Two people sitting side by side can be described as being distant from each other, and that's in emotional terms. All of our symbolism and descriptions of God are only mere aspects, imprints of imprints of Hashem. The only way we can truly know God is to transcend the physical realm and become close to God in a spiritual sense. The Torah states, You shall follow the Lord your God and fear Him and keep His commandments, obey Him and serve Him and bind yourself to Him. And that's from Deuteronomy 3. I'm going to paraphrase a section from the Talmud Soda. Um, how can you bind yourself to God? For the Lord your God is a consuming fire. And that's from Deuteronomy 9.3. The answer is that we bind ourselves to Hashem by imitating His attributes. In a spiritual sense, closeness is resemblance. And um, because... I'll go into that in a minute. Things that, are, th- things that resemble each other in, are considered close spiritually in the spirituals that differ are distant. So again, to reiterate this, this concept that closeness spiritually is, um, is a resemblance. Differences are is distant in spiritual terms. And it says, and, um, it says, you shall be holy for I am holy. Um, we bind ourselves to Hashem. We cling to Him by working to resemble Hashem, by imitating Hashem in this world. And it says in Psalms 125.4 that God is good to the good. So closeness means sameness. Thank you very much. Closeness is similarity. Differences is distance. But in this world, mankind is at a great disadvantage in that Hashem's presence in this world is concealed. The physical overwhelms and conceals the spiritual. In this world, evil exists as a result of God's constraint allowing for the possibility of choice. And he says in Isaiah 45, 7, I form light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. It's a hard verse for some people to take. Just as man must have free will, so he must have the opportunity to exercise his free will. Ultimately, evil is for is here for us to conquer, but evil exists to fulfill God's ultimate purpose as well. Therefore, this world exists to us as a place of ultimate challenge. And there's a really important principle. The greater the challenge, the greater the reward. The good that we can do in this world is exponentially greater than that of Adam and Eve before the fall. The world was made for those who overcome it. 
In God's revelation, his light in this world comes through his chesed, through his kindness. And I'm just reiterating that because that is a very important concept, that chesed, kindness, and mercy, triumphs the evil, darkness, and justice. The greatest feat in creation could be said that in this world, God has erased his footsteps, so, so to speak. We don't see God because he doesn't wish it to be so. So at this time period, because of this hidden aspect of God, this is a real time period of earning and striving. Closeness to God in, in the spiritual sense, okay, we are, we're already close to God in a spiritual sense, so the question that you have to ask yourself before you delve into the spiritual realm section is uh, we're creatures that exist in the realm of emotions and connections and if you look at an animal there really is like there's no good like I've heard a rabbi say there's no good dog or bad dog it's bad owners or good owners if you ever watch the dog whisper you'll see that it's they don't have that they don't live in the realm of choice like we do they have a very dynamic um, beings I mean, if you look at higher primates, they're very dynamic. They, they have emotional connections. They have all these things, but they don't sit and ponder God. They don't, they don't have moral dilemmas. Um, you know, if a lion doesn't eat a gazelle, it's because the gazelle is too fast and couldn't, he couldn't get it. It's not because he said, oh, the gazelle's bad, having a bad day. The gazelle's sick. The lion's not going to say, you know, you're having a bad day. I'll just, I'll just let you, you take a day off. So they exist in a different realm than us. We are. We are unique in creation in that we have this connectivity to each other and to God. So you ask yourself, what is reality based on this? So I'm going to <laughs> attempt in my own muddled way to, to discontinue from this point. Reality can be defined in many different ways. But the fact is, in Judaism, understanding that reality really does exist. And there are some religious systems that say that reality is just a mere illusion that life and consciousness is not actually existent it's all just so but Judaism says reality is real <laughs> it's really here uh, we have various ways to detect reality through our touch through taste through smell through sound and but we know that the ultimate reality is God and if Hashem wishes for something to exist it exists if he wishes for something to not exist it doesn't exist some reality though for us is in the realm of faith for it to be believed. Torah and, and tradition tells us that there are realms of reality that we don't necessarily comprehend. So we have to believe in certain amount of faith. But there are times that we can see those realities, um, the effects of those realities in our own world. And a limited example is electricity. You see the effects of electricity, but you don't necessarily see the electrons flowing through the wires. Um, but you definitely can feel and see the effects of electricity. Um, so the question is, why is God hidden in this world? Why is he concealed behind the clothing of nature? And that's because if he were to reveal himself openly in creation, um, our free will would disappear. The idea is that you know, if, if you were sudden, if you were continually in the presence of Hashem, constantly aware of his presence, um, it's really not a choice. It's like your parents standing in the kitchen telling you not to eat cookies. You know, as long as they're there, you're not going to do it. Um, but when you, uh, when they're away, then that's where the ultimate test comes in. Um, I think I already said that we know from Torah and tradition there are aspects of our reality that we're not able to perceive. And so I'm just going to take a quick step back and ask, Okay, we have the idea of the spiritual world. This, this connectivity to God comes in the spiritual sense that the true way to know God is through spiritual connection. And so the question is, if that is true, we know that ultimately Hashem isn't physical, um, that our greatest connection to Hashem comes through it spiritually, then what is the purpose of the physical realm? Why is it necessary? Um, so that... Before we delve into that, there's a question to ask is what is the difference between physical, the material world, and the spiritual? And this is a hard concept, and like this is where it may get a little bit difficult. I'm trying to convey it in the best sense possible. So please, if you don't understand, stop me. Um, the difference between the physical and the spiritual is space. In the spiritual realm, there's no space. Um, 
and that is important to understand because in the spiritual realm it's impossible to bring two opposites together and draw you back to the idea that in a spiritual sense for things to be close they have to be similar so things that are dissimilar can't by their nature be brought together in the spiritual realm the greatest example of this disparity um, is man and God God is we know that Hashem is pure spiritual being there's no physicality to God at all and it would be impossible for man and God to be brought together due to the fact that Hashem created man with a choice that we have the power to choose and I don't know if anybody watches the matrix but the problem is choice mankind in a sense has mobility it's a space that God has created for us to choose this realm of possibility of choice that um, causes us to, to exist in a physical sense and um, because of this mobility that man has in the space that we exist in, um, we have the option of the spiritual aspects being bound to physical aspects. And not only can the physical and the spiritual be bound together in this realm, but two opposites can literally be bound together in one, in one entity. And the greatest example of that is the understanding in Judaism of the Yitzhar Hara, which is... Um, this inclination to do evil in the Yitzhar HaTov, which is this inclination to do good. And see, these are two warring, very different aspects brought together in one person, and it can me make you into a bit of a schizophrenic <laughs> in regards to how you, how you choose to act in this world. Um, the concept of this non-physical realm is very difficult to understand and comprehend, but it's essential because um, this is the realm that we that we we are we have to traverse to find true connectivity to God. And in my opinion, after stating these arguments for um, he based, after stating all these concepts and these ideas, now he's saying you're on this spiritual journey. Now you need to know what you're going to encounter. And so, in my opinion. This is why the Ram Call is placing the spiritual realm at this point. And this idea of space is really important in that that's in the angelic realm, and we're going to be getting into angels and the Shadim and all these other concepts in a moment. But in the angelic realm, the idea is that angels are they have they're created with a purpose and they can't they can't um, they can't go from one purpose they have no choice they they serve a function they can't go outside of that function there's apps they're they're, they're bound to their programming 100 percent there's no mobility for them for us there's mobility and that mobility is space and that is the physical realm and that's how we operate choice and as a result of this space that we encounter it creates this dark physical course thing that's quite polar opposite of god and and that's the wrong call says is the this, this is the the conundrum for the for our our own self and not only that it's it's um the physical realm is skewed against us so um if you don't have any questions and that was my just summary to get this to one five but this idea of space I do have one other thing to read before I get going. Um, into five. It's before you get. This is the Ram. This is Rabbi Arya Kaplan. He is the translator of this of the Drech Hashem, um, and he actually has quite a few books. So before we get into him, and this, he he did a really he did a book called Inner Space. I'm going to read just a paragraph and then get into one five. Um, one of the most important foundations of our faith is a belief that God is an absolute unity in every possible respect. We see that God is a simple unity, absolutely simple and absolutely one. Not that there's one God and not two, that there's only God. So there is no element of form or structure or plurality in him whatsoever. So when we see God as a plurality, when we see God as this fractured being, when we relate to God as a father, we relate to God as our as a judge we relate to God in mercy. These are all this is this isn't because God is broken up into bits. God is is absolutely one 
and it's only our limited perspective that sees it otherwise. Um, but he says, this brings up a really tricky question. How does God, who is absolutely simple, interact with all the different aspects or parts of his creation? How does the one interact with the many? While we are pondering this question, however, and before we attempt to answer it, we're led to an even more perplexing one. According to this teaching, um, God's simple essence is so powerful that it must be hidden if creation is to exist at all. If, on the other hand, God would withdraw himself completely, creation would utterly cease to exist. We thus have a paradoxical situation where the very existence of anything but God himself becomes extremely tenuous. The question, therefore, is no longer how can one interact with the many, but how can a many exist at all? The answer, okay, the answer to this question in the previous one is explained by the, the fact that God has created a spiritual dimension. This dimension is made up of every basic concept needed to create and sustain the universe. It is essentially through this spiritual domain that God interacts with the universe. It, it thus forms a bridge between God and creation and acts as a step-down mechanism which prevents creation from being overwhelmed by God's essence while still being infused by it. It is this spiritual dimension that makes it possible for us to speak about God's multifaceted relationship to the universe without violating the basic principle of his unity and his simplicity. Any action or state of being that we might ascribe to God refers to something that God created in order to interact with the universe, not to God himself. Thus, without some knowledge of how this dimension is structured, a person cannot really know how God interacts with us at all. In addition, as we shall see, knowledge of this spiritual dimension provides us with a key to the entire prophetic tradition. And you'll see that he really will build up a lot of the principles in the spiritual realm when you get into the realm of prophecy. Beginning with the Bible itself and, com and culminating with abstract ideas, which are another domain of teaching. If we, are here, if we were to imagine the spiritual domain, therefore, it could be described as an infinitely huge spiritual computer. This computer is programmed to fulfill God's one ultimate purpose of bestowing good upon his creation. The main difference between the spiritual domain and a computer is that the components of the former consist of intelligence, sensitivity, and spiritual beings. Since the main point of, the theoretic, of this theory is to resolve the paradox of God's interaction with creation, it deals mostly with the, exclusively with the nature structure and dynamics of this domain. So this is inner space, and this is, his dom this is an introduction to this book. But again, you can see the heavy influence of the Ram Kahl in most, a lot of Ari Kaplan's writings. And so and I think this is a really good overview to the spiritual realm, because a lot of the, the, the aspects of the spiritual realm that the Ram Kahl delves into isn't necessarily its structure, it's the components. Like, it's trying to, trying to understand a computer by taking a sledgehammer and rebuilding it. <laughs> it's not necessarily the easiest thing to do. And um, so so this is, it can be confusing, and we're getting into the realm of, again, and I'm, I'm going to reiterate the purpose of this is just for study, not to necessarily say that you, the concepts presented in, these, in this text is something that you have to embrace and believe, and I'm trying to convert you to a specific way of thinking, but this is delving into the realm of, there's a lot of um, tradition coming into play here that the Torah does introduce some concepts and it doesn't really expound upon them. I should say scripture does that. And um, without giving a lot of background, you have some concepts that are interjected in different places and you're like, what is that? Where did that come from? So um, you may not agree with a lot of the things and you don't. And, and just keep in mind open to study and to see what this belief system entails. This is very much an uh, accurate presentation of, of the spiritual realm and that type of thing is believed in Judaism. Um, angels are created for a specific purpose. They don't have mobility. Angels of judgment, they can't become angels of mercy. They have no choice. They have one mission. Um, i trying to think if I can... I have an example. Um, but they're, they're created with a purpose. They can't choose. They don't even have the possibility or the realm of choice to choose to do anything different than the mission they are on. Um... I'm trying to think. There's an example that um, Arya Kaplan gives 
in his inner space that like one angel asks another what I think it's Daniel asks an angel a question he's, and so this other angel asks the one angel because he didn't know it's not his realm he had to go and so the idea is that angels can't act outside the realm of authority that they've been given by Hashem where we I'm not saying that mankind can go outside of our authority, but we have mobility, we have choice, we have the on and off switch in creation in this world. We can we can create a great world of good. We can do um, a, a great amount of evil as well. And so, um, so he's getting into the spiritual realm for precisely the purpose of the space that we live in we aren't the only inhabitants of this space the physical realm and the spiritual realm that mankind as physical beings and as spiritual beings we live in all these worlds um, we're, we don't live alone there are other entities that God created and they interact with us and are existent beside us and like if you swim in the ocean you want to know what flora and fauna are there um, and so he's giving you this is this is these are these are beings and entities that coexist with us, and they do have influence, and they're given power and authority by Hashem for specific purposes. So, that being said, I will begin reading. If you have any questions before, please just go ahead and ask. Okay, so on page seventy-five for those of you who have the Feldheim version here. And this is one five chapter one, I'm sorry, part one chapter five, the spiritual realm. Creation in general consists of two basic parts: the physical and the spiritual. The physical is that which we experience with our senses, and in turn is divided into the terrestrial and the celestial. The celestial includes heavenly bodies, as the stars and their planets. The terrestrial includes everything in the lowest sphere, the earth, water, atmosphere, and every detectable thing they contain. The spiritual consists of all entities which are not physical and which cannot be detected by physical means. These, in turn, are, are also divided into two categories, souls and transcendental beings. Souls comprise a class of spiritual entities created to be put into physical bodies to be joined and strongly bound to these bodies, acting upon them in order to perform various functions in them at different times. Transcendental beings comprise a, comprise a class of spiritual entities that are not created to be put into physical bodies. These, in turn, are also divided into two categories. The first category consists of forces, and the second of angels. These transcendental beings also exist on many levels, each type having its own laws and distinct nature depending upon its level and its place in the general scheme. So great in variation between different angel types that each group can be called a different species in a general class. This general class is the angelic. I'll read just a little bit further because we're going to touch on all three here. There is, however, another class that is like an intermediate between the spiritual and the physical. This consists of entities that cannot be detected by physical means and are not bound by the limitations and laws of ordinary detectable matter. For this reason, they might improperly be considered spiritual. Their essence, however, is very different from that of the angelic class, even though they may resemble them in some ways. These entities also have specific attributes and unique limitations based on their true nature. They are therefore considered a separate class, namely of that of the Shadim, which is demons. This class also contains individual types, there being where each type may be considered a separate species belonging to the general class of Shadim. Of all the things that exist, however, only man alone consists of two opposite two absolute opposites, namely a spiritual soul and a physical body. Nothing else in all of creation shares this quality. Okay, um, so getting into the idea of forces and angels. Judaism does not believe that the natural world we see is, um, there's no such thing as natural law, that everything that exists has a spiritual source. It has 
I've talked about a little bit before about the, the pen in your hand is there like the like the video image on your computer screen if you have the old time CRTs or if your television screen is constantly being refreshed it has it has a physical manifestation but its source is ultimately from God and so these forces work through the direction of God to sustain and um, keep creation in existence. That every blade of grass, every everything you touch, taste, feel has a spiritual force within it and continually creating, continually refreshing it in our world. That if you could spiritually speaking pull back the layer of natural laws you would see the plumbing of the world and those are the forces the plumbing and the wiring and all the background things that keep the world going are the forces and then you have those um, and then you have the angelic realm as well and I have it's a I don't know how much people would like to get into the angelic realm but there is tradition going on and he talks about different angels and there are different types that each type of angel they're so different from the, from each other that they can be considered different oh yeah um thank you i will i didn't i didn't i didn't harp on <laughs> i didn't talk about that enough at the end but i'm going to when we get to the um, to the next level um so you have the angelic realm and you have the forces and these are these are the archetypical spiritual beings. They don't have a place in our physical realm. Not that they can't manifest, but that is not their home. They truly are spiritual beings and angels are the number one. The angels can't um I'm trying to think of the quote now. The angels just they, they don't have a choice. They can't they can't they can't um go off the path of their of their function that their closeness to God they don't their reality is not in our physical realm the space that we talk about the constriction of this world um, is is our reality and I'll go back in again and say that this idea of consume this idea of constriction of basically a vacuum space for us to have the realm of choice and that this realm that we exercise the free choice in is called physical and it's hard <laughs> it's it's that's the space that God created and we said that that's the biggest I mean the miracle isn't that God created something from nothing that we exist that that we have we're complex beings that the the multiple complexities of creation stand in perfect balance to keep us alive each day that's not the miracle the miracle is that the uh, that this infinite God could contract and create and make a space for creation that doesn't completely overwhelm us and allow for the possibility of a choice that God could really so masterfully hide his footsteps in creation allowing us to covering you know covering his tracks allowing us to have the ability to choose that God's presence isn't so overwhelming to us that we are constantly aware of God and as a result we have the ability to make the choice to come close to God so it gives us a chance to come close to him it, and, and that's what the spiritual um, space is for this is and but unlike other entities there are some entities in our own creation that exist only in the physical realm they really don't have spiritual connectivity and that's what he goes on into saying um, one must be very must be careful not to erroneously consider that other animals are the same as man in this respect meaning that they have a their opposites the spiritual and physical although animals do have a soul it's not a spiritual entity although an animal's soul may be the most ethereal of all physical entities it still does not enter the realm of the spiritual and so it's really important to understand that just in our physical realm we have we coexist with other entities they're animals they're plants there's there's minerals there's of the elements of creation we coexist with them they don't they ultimately have a spiritual connection but they don't have the soul we are unique and we have the ability to transcend the physical realm and connect spiritually and that is that we can live in both the physical and spiritual world 
and that is that is why man is so unique and so powerful and has the ability to do such unmitigated damage and mind-blowing good that we have this ability to affect the world where the angels when they do something it's only because God has ordered them to do so exactly you don't see monkeys and, and chimpanzees though they are very intelligent and they're very dynamic creatures uh, you don't see them, you know, wondering, you know, is God love me? And, um, you know, is there really a God and does he exist? And you don't see, you know, monkey works of philosophy. It, it, it's just that's not, it's, that's the aspect of, of God that God has pl- placed within us. Um, it's this spiritual soul, this higher soul, this connection to God that, that strives and drives us to find Hashem in this world said about that um, trying to, I had some notes up for the angelic realm um, so so the angels and the the Shadim here the other word for them is Mazikim they're, they're um, troublemakers destroyers um and so I'll get a little bit further ahead here before I comment too much. I do have I had a section and and I did a previous study of the of the understanding of there's orders of angels and where they stand. I don't want to get so focused on on those um issues right now, but if somebody's um if, yeah, it's where the the concept is where these entities draw their power from, and that the idea is when you you have a creative process, you have an idea, and then you have to have a plan, and then you actually have to carry out the plan, and so the idea is just like you have wiring in your home to carry to carry electricity, and you have the atoms and molecules that make to make the physical world possible. That there are there are forces, there are entities that are constantly um, connected to the spiritual realm to keep these things going, kind of like the the ultimate um, virtual reality. It, but other than the fact that it's real, this is real. It really exists. The consequences of this world are true. But we also understand that everything that exists ultimately stems from God. Um, and so when you think of forces and you think of the angelic realm, there are under, there's an understanding that there are levels in the heavenly realm. You can see that in different um, parts of the New Testament if you look. That, that, and that's, in, that's very true in Judaism that they have the, the understanding that there are levels in the spiritual and heavenly realm. And so these forces draw power to create, to keep creation constantly going. And again, to draw the idea of computer programming and, and language is that you know it's it's like uh, these everything has a purpose, everything has a place, and with the exception of man, we really can't. Nothing can can um, change its position in the world. It can change its purpose. Man can take though the physical world. He can take a a glass of water and you know throw it at his sister or give it to somebody who's thirsty and drink so by your actions you can take the elements of the physical realm and change them from mundane and dark and lowly and you can elevate them and that is why um, I'm trying to say here and that is why when we say that the world was created for us, that the world is here for us to overcome evil, that is what we have to use the elements of creation, the gifts and abilities that God has given us, the makeup of our own body, of our own spiritual self, and to use these to the greatest extent possible to serve God with everything that we have, like the Shemaya, with your heart, with your mind, with your possessions. You're to take every aspect of this world and to utilize those resources in the service of Hashem. And by doing so, you elevate creation. And there's a really funny story, I think it's from the Talmud, that's a pretty, I'll paraphrase it, that, you know, everyone's sitting on a boat, these poor people, they've been shipwrecked and they're on a boat, 
and this man, there's a little bit of water in the bottom of the boat, so this man takes out a drill, and, he, and he's putting a hole in the bottom of the boat, and everyone in the boat says, you know, what are you doing? He says, I'm letting the water out. He's like, you're going to sink us. And the other, and, and he, the man says, why are you caring? It's underneath my seat. And the point is, we're all in this boat together. We're all in creation together, and the action of one does really affect the, um, the, status of, of, of all of creation. And in the physical realm, we have physical laws and um, we have gravity. If you jump from a building, you're going to go splat unless God suspends all of the all of those uh, um, laws of gravity at that specific moment, which he does. It's called a miracle. But in so you're getting into the understanding of now we're, we're going to be moving into the spiritual realm as we transcend and try to connect to God. But there are, just as we have physical realities of our world, there are spiritual realities, there are spiritual um, possibilities, and that the consequences that we have, we're not interacting as, as lone, lone travelers on our way to God, that there are other entities there, and they have a purpose. And sometimes that purpose um, can be um, for good or bad that they're here to judge it, they're here as punishment, they're here as to reward us. The idea in Judaism is that there are angels of judgment, there are angels of mercy, and you have one or the other dependent upon your actions. And um, so do you have any... I'm not getting too specific into different species of angels at this point. Um, Let's see here. And the other concept that's really important to understand is the idea of the mazikim, the shadim, the demons. And so the, there's a teaching that these, these entities were... Let me backtrack a minute. There's an idea in Judaism of this period that's called the Erev, that not quite day, not quite night, it's that in-between, that mixture. Is it day, is it night, it's that in-between time. And so... There is, and this concept is um, in creation as well, that there is, there is this in-between time where God was in the process of, of finishing creation, and you have this Erev, this change from creative process to his rest, and it's this in-between state. And this is where, um, yeah, the Twilight Zone. Can we have the music? Not kidding. Um, and so this... This is the realm for the of the of these shadim, and where they exist. So they have spiritual aspects and they have physical aspects, but not to confuse them with man. They have no ability to change. They don't have that. They don't live in the physical realm as we do. Their reality is very different than ours. But all of these angels and demons and these forces can act in our world dependent upon our actions and can interact with us dependent upon our actions as well. So I'll continue finishing up section one. Man is also a living creature and therefore has a similar animal soul. Besides this animal soul, however, man also has a higher soul. The higher godly soul is a separate entity, completely different from the body and far removed from the physical. Only by virtue of man's t- decree, okay, sorry, only by virtue of God's decree is the higher soul able to reside in man's physical body for the purpose outlined in previous chapters. Again, this really important concept of this, this contraction, this concealment is so important because that creates the physical realm. That creates the arena of choice and our ability to have a chance. Unlike the angels, we, we have the chance and the ability to relate to God very differently than any other creation. Sorry. And um, so before I get into, um, into the next section, I just wanted to ask if there was any questions. Okay. Nope. I will continue on then. We are well aware of physical things, and their natural properties and laws are well known. Spiritual concepts, on the other hand, are outside our realm of experience, and therefore cannot be adequately described. When we speak of spiritual entities and phenomena, we must therefore rely completely on the traditions handed down to us. 
One of these fundamentals is that everything in the physical world has a counterpart among the transcendental forces. Every entity and process in the physical world is linked to these forces following a system decreed by God's wisdom. These forces, therefore, are the roots of all physical things, and everything in the physical world is a branch and a result of these forces. The physical and the spiritual are thus bound together like links in a chain. We also know from tradition that every physical entity and process is under the charge of some type of angel. These angels have the responsibility of maintaining the natural order, as well as bringing about changes according to God's decree. So every blade of grass, every animal, everything has a spiritual entity behind it. And that can be hard for some people to, to fathom, but the idea is that that is how reality, physicality, is brought into into existence and exactly yeah somewhat that there's these these concepts that there is above us every cat is is a has its own life it's a life but it it comes from this supernal source of catness <laughs> if that makes any sense that everything we have within us stems from a source so it acts within that realm go ahead yeah, if you can, if you can um, type that in. If not, you can wait just a second. So what I'm saying is a cat acts like a cat, not only because of its DNA, um, but because it has a pre-programmed um, cat <laughs> in the heaven, in the spiritual sense. Um, well, it's getting into the, yeah, I'll answer that in just a moment. So how a cat acts, how a chicken acts, how a tree grows, how all these things have their roots, their programming in the spiritual realm, and there is an entity, a force, an angel, causing that to become reality, that nothing happens, this is, this is how God directs creation. Now, if you understand these processes, then you can get into some very interesting areas, and that is, you can into the idea of not only idolatry, but you get into witchcraft as well, that that these forbidden practices that God says don't do them is people trying to manipulate these forces in these angelic realms and trying to tap into this system by which God keeps the world running. It's kind of like trying to hack in and get free cable. <laughs> it's not. It's not. It's not acceptable. It's not okay. It can be very dangerous. Oh, trying to full of full of what? Just out of curiosity. And so trying to transcend the the construct, the way that God has has set up the proper way to connect with him, out, going outside of those bounds has consequences. Oh. And, and God says, don't do it. He set up the system. He knows how the, how the spiritual realm works. Like the Ram Paul says, it's very difficult for us to comprehend the spiritual realm because we don't exist in the spiritual we have we exist in the physical realm our spiritual self is really concealed by the by our physicality by materialism our soul and the just even the light of Hashem is, is hidden within creation to us and as a result we don't always comprehend the consequences of our actions we can be doing great damage spiritually and not even know that and so God says there are there are ways to sh circumvent and get you get the things you want, and this is we talked about of Odazara, which is this serving um, serving the externals, which is kind of like idolatry, but where you try to get the stuff, the stuff of creation, power, money, influence, these type of things. You see, in even the Torah itself has has stories of of like Bilam and his donkey. You know, he really was trying to manipulate the forces to get what he what he desired. He was trying to circumvent um, God to, to curse Israel, and he wasn't able to because God stopped him. But he was trying to manipulate these forces to act on his behalf. So you see, even within Torah, that these principles exist, that there are, there are ways to tap into these entities, or that these entities can become agents of God's judgment on his behalf. Where? Um... 
Oh, sorry. Um, so, let me see here. So not a blade of grass, not a not anything not anything that happens in the physical realm doesn't happen without God decreeing it to be so. Um, I'll continue. Any questions or comments at this point? But this is before I say that. This is really important to understand because if you have the correct action, the correct way to go to God, there there are systems in place to keep you on that pathway. There are systems to um, just like your body has elements that are unpleasant, but they're very important for you to function your body when you're sick or there's a disease process going on, you have pain, you have other symptoms. And so in the physical realm, as physical beings, we really may not comprehend all of our actions. So God has placed within creation systems to show us that something's not functioning properly, that our actions are not correct, and he's placed within creation corrective measures and um, ways to flag, to tell us that we're, um, give us warnings that we're not necessarily doing the correct thing and that we're doing damage. So I'll continue on a bit more. Um, the existence and state of being of the physical universe thus emanate from the highest forces and are dependent upon them. Whatever exists in the physical world is a result of something that takes place among these forces. This is true of both what existed in the beginning and what transpires with the passage of time. These forces were the first things created, and they were arranged in various systems and placed in different domains. Everything that came about later was a result of this, following rules willed by God linking these forces to the physical world. Everything that happens in the past or present thus has its origin in the processes taking place between these forces. The existence, state, pattern, and every other quality that exists among these forces are a result of what is relevant to them by virtue of their essential nature. The existence, state, arrangement, and other phenomena involving physical things in turn depend upon what is transmitted and reflected to them by these forces following the essential nature of these physical entities. So again, getting to the getting to the idea of computer generated realities that we live I, I, without this analogy, I, I, that's how I, I understand it, and it's the best way that every computer you buy is not reinventing the wheel. There are there's programming that is unique, and it can create different programs, like computer languages that can create different programs, and so these forces have. Um, are set in place to keep creation going. Like you said, this is the plumbing, this is the hard wiring. If you were to, quote unquote, peel back the, the natural realm and see how existence is kept into being you know, and, and can constantly being refreshed, you would see these forces as those phenomenon. And again, going back to, you know, there's forces that create trees. They don't suddenly go and create, you know, um, SUVs, they, they, they continue to create what they were meant to create and to continue to bring into existence what they were meant to bring into existence, just like a computer program. But those being, that being said, there is, there's the concept that these forces can be polluted by the actions of mankind. And if you look in Torah, God says when Israel reaches a certain point of sin that the land itself will turn against them, that the land will vomit them out when they get to a certain point of of defiling their own souls. And so these forces can be turned against you. It's kind of like polluting up the river. You're polluting these forces and they will in turn um, cause problems for you. And so as a result... God, these forces can be used as a realm of judgment that the land itself, the forces that keep them, keep the land, you know, the rain and the trees and the water, these type of things, these forces that keep um, our reality in existence can be used also by God. And as a result, knowing that these forces exist is very important in that. And you'll see some odd commandments in the Torah. You ask yourself why. Like one of them is when you go to war, don't cut a fruit tree. And it's 
like you're going to war, but you're not going to cut a tree down. And so in some of these concepts of the Torah are based, are based upon what these forces are and, and, and their nature. Um, so I'm trying to think where I left off. Um, okay. And so, like I said, again, I'm going back to the computer analogy to say that, that you know, a bird is a bird because it is it, it's it comes from this supernal source of birds, and a cat is a cat because of that. And so, um, if you have any questions or comments? I'm going to take a quick break so you can type in your comments or come to the mic. Yeah, can uh. Can, can I be heard? I, my, can anyone hear me? Type a one if you hear me. If you don't, okay. Yeah, I just wanted to, this is really kind of a FYI. Uh, before we started this discussion some weeks back, uh, for several weeks, we uh, strongly encouraged everyone to get the book. Uh, understandably, if you do not have this book and have not read it or are in the process of reading it prior to our discussion, this stuff is going to be very confusing. It, it's uh, unfortunately, it's it's somewhat assumed that you have the book, um, and of course, if you have the book, it makes it much more understandable. You also, since you've read previous sections, you are up to date and up to speed on on what's being discussed. So, um, uh, you know, you have to. I'm sorry if, if it's confusing for people and if you can't understand. Again, we strongly uh, urge you to please get the book. Uh, it's a very good book, first of all. I, I love this book. And um, you would enjoy the book anyway. But just want to make that little announcement that uh, it's understandable if you have confusion if you do not have the book. And uh, one more reason that you really need to get the book. And it's not that expensive. Uh, Mike is free. Um I would encourage everyone to go to that website uh, that I just posted. <laughs> That's probably how I lost my uh, audio when I posted the link right above there. That has uh, audio files of the previous classes. It'll catch you up. Like Bruce said, you got to have the book because there are certain terms. Like uh, I noticed uh, one and only was wondering why we're talking about forces. Well, you, you need to know what the author of the book is talking about when he uses that term. Um, it's equivalent to almost to like archangels or that level of creation. Uh, one interesting point um, that is, was Isabel was talking about the difference between uh, all those things are related above and below. There is a, a difference in that when we're talking about uh, things I at that higher realm, they are not so um, time bound in history as, as down here. So um, you may, a uh, classic example is in the book of Revelation that may talk about something that sounds like it is going to occur in one section and something that sounds almost like that it has occurred already. And so which is it? And and in analyzing the text, you see that at one stage it's discussing this at that higher level of creation, that it is something that is uh, destined to play out in, in history at some point or another or repeatedly, whatever. And then at some point in the literal history of mankind does play out. So having an understanding of that helps also even with text like that. Um, I'm going to hand it back to Isabel. She's ready, but uh, um, I know she was taking a break. Okay. So anyhow, welcome, uh, everyone. And um, one second here. Hold on. Someone's going to occupy her. Uh. Yeah, I'm going to post them. We posted some new information on that web link uh, today, some resources, articles, and things. There's a particularly good one. Um, um, well, the interesting of angels, fallen angels having a choice, there's some tradition that, that implies that angels at some point did have some uh, limited uh, free will and that uh, since that time, uh, God took it away from them um, and hence all angelic names end with the suffix L-E-L, -E meaning that they serve God without any kind of free will. So you see, you know, uh, Raphael, Michael, Gabriel, they all end with that. that that's a tradition explaining that. Um, and when we talk about tradition, we're talking about what has been handed down from generation to generation to, uh, to the Jewish, from the Jewish people um, since Mount Sinai and even before then in some cases. 
So, as she said earlier, there's much in the Bible that leaves major gaps. The Bible is very, uh, very much open interpretation because of these big gaps in the details and brings up, it might mention uh, souls or demons or anything, and you're like, well, where does it explain this in detail? It doesn't. So, we rely on, uh, we rely on these things to, uh, to help us understand. And so we're teaching from a particular tradition. As she said earlier, this is not about debating the tradition. It's not about saying it's right or wrong. It's not saying you've got to convert. Or nothing like that. It's simply presenting material in a certain uh, stream, in a certain path that's been brought down. And, um, and so we'll go forward. Demons and angels. I don't know if we covered that yet or not. The same type of entity, according to the Ram Kal. We're going to cover that if we didn't. So I'm going to hand it back over to... Uh, I'm going to hand it back to uh, Isabel. Well, um, um, I put in a little bit of, I put a post in here, and pardon my poor typing skills too, but the tradition talking about the functions of angels, um, that there's a specific task given to every angel. Angels are only given one assignment at a time. Um, that angels not only control like the minutia of creation, like, um, but they also have large areas too, that there's physical areas and kingdoms, and um, but they can, that they have and angels may be given assignments for a specific period of time for a limited amount of time and that these are the messengers these are the these are the, the conveyance the spiritual conveyance to cause physical realities in our world that um when you have angels coming to intercede sent by god to intercede on behalf of people um coming to bring judgment on different communities that they're fulfilling specific tasks. That their angels are messengers. They're 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 serving the serving the king. Um, and why is it important to know this? Because you can see that um, we are, like I said, we have we have this tradition is important because we have we know that there's a reality beyond our own ability to perceive with our senses and that to deal effectively in this realm to have some kind of guiding um, principles and understanding of what we're encountering along the way is very important. Um, like I said, I've said before, I believe that I wouldn't try and, you know, do electrical wiring in my home because it's a pretty powerful, dangerous thing and to to handle it incorrectly has some severe consequences. Um, so I'll continue on with four, I think. Yeah, four. According to the principle, to this principle, every physical phenomena originates among the highest forces. There is, however, one exception to this rule, and that includes all things that depend on man's free will. God willed that man should be able to choose freely between good and evil, and therefore made man absolutely independent in this respect. Man was thus given the power to influence the world and its creatures in any manner his free will desires. The world, therefore, contains two opposite general influences. The first is that of natural determinism, while the second is indeterministic. <laughs> uh, the deterministic influence is directed downward from on high, while the indeterministic is directed f upward from below. This is because the deterministic is the influence that stems from the highest forces, and therefore, when it is directed towards our material world, it is directed downwards. The indeterministic influence, on the other hand, is the result of man's free will here in the physical realm. Since both man and his actions are physical, the only direct influence that we can have is on physical things. Because of the linkage between the physical world and its highest forces, however, every time a physical thing is influenced, it, is also, it also has an effect on its counterpart among these forces. Since man's deeds in the world below are what influence these forces on high, man's influence is said to be directed upward. It is thus the exact opposite of the natural deterministic influences. So this is again the understanding of everything has a, if, if everything has a spiritual connectivity, if everything has a spiritual force behind it, that when you use an item, an object for good or for evil, that you're taking the energy of that that item and also the energy of the action and you're directing it towards either um, increasing God's light or um, decreasing God's light in the world by um, causing a greater amount of darkness and evil to exist. So there's a high priority placed upon 
how you act, how you interact in Torah, how you interact amongst um, the people in your lives, but also how you treat animals, what the type of clothing you wear, um, the mixtures of clothing that you wear, how you treat the environment, these land, um, the objects and how they were used in the service of God all become very important because it has spiritual consequences. What you eat, what you drink, um, all have spiritual consequences because there are spiritual forces behind them. So things that seem pretty innocuous in our world are not necessarily so because of the fact that um, they have spiritual sources behind them. And we as spiritual beings can be polluted by those as well. It's like drinking bad water for your soul. If you, if you participate in activities that are forbidden or you use things incorrectly, then you can cause spiritual damage to yourself. That the purpose and function of our soul is to connect to God and our actions in this world can um, cause that connectivity to be cut off um, and, God forbid, almost completely and completely severed, which is the whole point of creation, to receive God, to receive God, a portion of God, to cleave to God, is why we are here, and the method, the vehicle by which we can do that is our soul, and if that soul is polluted and damaged by our physical actions, because there is, it's reciprocal, um, what we do in the physical realm affects the spiritual, and what happens in the spiritual realm affects our physical realm. Um, we lose our spiritual antenna and our ability to um, connect to God in the, in the true way that we are. And you basically, literally, by cutting off your soul, become like an animal. Yeah, it's de- that's depression. You have you become like an animal. You you now have cut yourself off from the essence of your true being and um, you become isolated Um, so uh, in let's see here Um, so some of the commandments which may seem I don't know, if you look at it from a scientific standpoint or just even a cultural standpoint, it might seem pretty pretty crazy. But um, they're there for a purpose, they're there for a reason. This is the blueprint on how to, cur- how to tune our spiritual self into the f- God's frequency at a higher level. Um, binding and loosening, that's kind of a different realm of... I, I don't. It's a very different discussion point. <laughs> um, but that, as a as a result, if you, now going into the idea of the physical being polluted and spirit, um, the physical actions causing spiritual pollution. When you look at Israel and as they conquer the land in the book of Joshua, you'll see that there are cities, and even with Moshe and, and Israel, that there's cities that they go into where God says, don't you know, you can take the silver, you can take the gold, but none of the people or the animals. And there are places where where Israel is commanded to just decimate everything, to, to completely wipe everything out, to not nothing. Everything has been so polluted by the actions of the inhabitants that there's nothing redeemable, that everything has to be destroyed. And so you can see that the level of pollution is dependent upon the actions. And you say it's not physically polluted. It's the same gold. It wasn't, it wasn't as though the gold was inferior or that, you know, the animals weren't good or whatever. They, it was their spiritual pollution was, um, would contaminate Israel and cause severe damage. And you do see an example in Joshua where one man took that polluted goods within the camp and um, he caused extreme damage. I mean, um, Israel suffered a defeat for the first time, and they became spiritually tainted. It's the whole boat principle. And you had one man drilling a hole under his seat, and everyone suffered as a result. Yeah, his family lost out too. And so you can see that this is really important. And, and it seemed innocuous. It's hiding some gold. But if you understand that there are forces behind it, and these forces... And, can be turned against you, then you've just brought in, you've just brought in a nuclear weapon in the middle of your camp, and you don't even know it. And it's about, and so, it has there's some, some serious consequences for these things, and ultimately we'll stand before God in judgment and see how well or how poorly we took care of our neshamas 
through our actions here on earth but God doesn't want that he wants us to get it right to the greatest possibility in this world that he wants us to do ultimate good while we can this is not a diff- this is not an easy realm to exist in as a spiritual being but this is the realm that God has given us and we can affect great good but um, it's a continual process and so knowing that our actions now how you drink coffee in the morning for what purpose if you eat a good meal and you you know you thank Hashem and you go out and you do a good act and you've just elevated the coffee and and the burger and the meat all of these elements that could never serve God directly but now they can through you you can take these base elements of creation and turn them into something very good and turn them into um, vehicles to serve God and so it's like in the temple gold can't serve God but when the gold is taken by Israel to to content to make the um, tabernacle now these base elements were elevated in their status and became um, used by us to connect closer to God and um, let's see here I'm going to go in five a little bit and I have some some physics <laughs> God arranged things so that every matter falling within the realm of man's free will should be able to affect the transcendental forces through this indeterministic influence according to the measure and degree 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 set forth by God. This is true not only of man's deeds but even of his speech and thoughts. The amount and degree of this influence, however, cannot exceed the limits decreed and circumscribed by the highest wisdom. So there's a question that must be asked. Who are you as a person? Are you your body? Are you your mind? Are you your personality? When you start thinking about these questions, you can see that, you know, we we know we have a physical body and we know that we, you know, there's the belief that there's a spiritual self as well, that they're connected, so the connection's very, very dim in this world. So the question is, who is the real you? Are you your body? Are you your soul? Who are you? Are you your mind? If you took all your thoughts, all your motive, if you took your mind, let's say you could do a mind transplant and place your mind in another body, would you be you or would you be somebody else? And so this is a very important question because when you, we are creatures that live in the physical realm, but we have this entire world that we can withdraw into the realm of thought and, um, and how we can interact with ourselves through speech and writing this is very important imagination you can create elaborate concepts and ideas and you can convey them through speech through writing and you can influence and change the world I mean think about some of the greatest people in the world never change the world simply through the pen and so they, these are very strong forces and you ask yourself in this world if we were not just animals if we were we'd all be hunter gathering and warring with each other it's when people are able to transcend this realm and think of these different concepts and these different ideas um, but that that the realm of the spiritual is is bridged by thought and concepts and ideas and so when you get into spiritual matters like the level of Rakhoka, um, the Holy Spirit Rakhokadesh which is like the idea of um, of thought and connectivity and ideas coming into your head and, and, and enlightenment literally God's light pervading your your mind um, these are really abstract concepts that are difficult to convey but that is because they're spiritually based and so our consciousness our level of awareness is is a function and a form and a manifestation of our soul and some of the hardest concepts, some of the most difficult punishments, some of the most um, difficult trials people face are not necessarily physical ones, but they're, sp- they're mental ones. Shame, guilt, separation, depression, these negative emotions are brought forth in the spiritual realms. And also that when we interact, you see a lot of the interaction done between these entities, the angels and mankind, is done in the sp- in, in, in through dreams and through visions, and they're not necessarily physical manifestations. It's this it's this spiritual realm that we can't that sometimes some people have glimpses of or ability to 
have some type of awareness of. But in our own self, we can see the influence of our soul through our emotions. And um, if you look at Adam and Eve as their souls were polluted through, the, through their actions, they experienced shame and separation and all of these things that weren't necessarily a part of their psyche before. And as a result, it caused their actions to change. And... Um, Sorry. Um, so the other thing that I wanted to talk about is the, the concept of um, the free will and the space that we live in, this space that we call reality or the physical realm. And um, I know there's been an ongoing discussion about you know creation and how and and the, um, knowledge and that type of thing. But there's an interesting concept that's been built into creation that exists also as a spiritual concept. There's an idea of indeterministic influences that I have it pulled up. I'm going to read, um, if I may. Um, this is one of my notes here. Ron Cross stresses the importance of man's free will that exists with the exception of the rule that everything in the physical realm is caused by what is dictated by the highest forces. And in the Talmud it says, um, everything in the, is in the hand of heaven except the fear of heaven. Um, so the critical concept brought forth here is the fact that our reality consists of both deterministic and indeterministic influences existing both at the same time. Because man, via his soul, interacts with the spiritual realm, particularly the mixed realm, when that is that spiritual realm that's just above us, um, he is in a position to alter events, sometimes drastically. God created every point A and point B, but allows for leeway from one to the other. Um, there's a concept in Judaism that there's no such thing as a negative prophecy having to come true. This is based on the concept that man has a free will and has the ability to, to, shoo, to, sh to, to do teshuva, to turn, literally turn back to the correct path. And the, and the, the primary example of this is Nineveh. Um, you know, Jonah's told by God, you know, the inhabitants of the city, they're going to die. He doesn't say if they repent. He says they're going to die. Um, and it doesn't come to pass because the city, the, the whole city, the whole inhabitants of Nineveh do teshuva. And the decree is, doesn't become a reality in their time. And so there's this, this concept is interestingly enough based, um, has, a spirit, has a physical counterpart in our own world. And... We have this concept of we're very linear people. I mean, most people are. Most people think from, you know, A causes B, B causes C. We have, we live on a timeline. That's how we function. That's, we have to function that way or we'd be, or we'd be in trouble. Um, but in the, we have as, a, as individuals, most people have the idea that if you have enough information, you can predict the outcome. That if you know enough that you can have with a certain amount of certainty how things will turn out. But there's um, a really interesting concept in physics and there's that um, nothing is 100% certainty. There is absolutely, at every level of our world, an uncertainty built in. And Rabbi Arya Kaplan, the man who translated this book, was also a physicist before he became a rabbi. And he wrote a note, a very interesting note. It says, it is interesting to note that according to the mo to most modern science, scientific picture of the world, free will is an integral part of creation. Science teaches us that there is an element of indeterminacy or free will inherent in the very quantum nature of matter. And this clearly indicates that the universe was created as an arena for free willed creatures such as man. It is this freedom of will that gives man a wider choice than merely to react to his surroundings. Although an individual's actions may be influenced by his heredity and environment, neither of these is absolutely determinate in his actions. So it doesn't, just because you came from a poor home and you don't have all of the advantages of somebody doesn't necessarily mean that you will not be able to succeed in this world. And there's this because the inhabitants of Nineveh were absolutely wicked and they determined God determined that they had crossed the line and he was going to destroy them. They repented and um, it didn't happen in their day. So there's this indeterministic factor that we have until the actual deed is done, the ability to do teshuva, to repent, to turn back, to turn away from what we're doing and turn back to God. And there's no other creature in this world that has that, that, has that ability. And as a result, we can change the world in a very dramatic way. 
And I think the biggest example of that as well is Moshe interceding on behalf of Israel. You know, God says more than a few times in the Torah, okay, I'm done, I'm going to destroy them and start over with you. And, um... Hmm? Um, and I'm going, and, and God intercedes and... Uh, I say Moshe intercedes on behalf of Israel and the decree is turned away because you have this indeterministic factor. And you look at David as another example of somebody who had these um who had this great potential to go bad according to traditional understanding, but he took those forces and you can see glimpses of it, his ability, his his strong draw towards um towards this strong Yitzhara, this strong inclination towards evil, and he was able to to mass that energy and use it in the service of God. And somebody who could have been very debased and very sinful was able to elevate himself to a very close state to God. Um, and so the tr- same is true in these forces, that, that they are, I wouldn't say they're neutral, because these forces have have a mission. They're either to judge, either agents of judgment or agents of um, mercy, but that we can, how we're interacting with God at the time determines on how the angelic realm, how these forces, how the Shadim interact with us. And unless you make yourself known to them, most of the time, I don't want to say you're a target, but most of the time their influence is very little in your life, um, unfortunately, or, or fortunately. Um, so I'm going to stop talking and, and allow for some more questions or comments. Mike is free. Isabel, I just wanted to comment that you're doing a great job. But once in a while you get out of the driving lane and get into the passing lane and talk real fast. And I have a hard time catching all your words. That's okay. You know your subject very well and you have a lot to say. But when you get in that fast passing lane... Uh, you lose me. That may be just me. <laughs> Mike is free. Oh, sorry. <laughs> now, I, I was going to say uh, one thing that needs to be understood, too, is what's being covered here is are, are, it's at a very, very basic level. Okay? Uh, the, the concepts that are in the book that uh, we're going through uh, again, they're very basic. It, it can be expanded upon enormously, and it is in other books and other readings. And uh, I tell you, I, I what Isabel's doing is a very difficult job. <laughs> to be perfectly honest, I, I couldn't do it. Uh, it's very difficult to to try to explain something when there's so many other things that really need to be explained to fully grasp it. So it's a which is another reason why having the book is so essential, because that way you can read the book, you can reread a sentence when you don't understand it, you can go back, you can underline if you want, you can mark pages, whatever. You really need the book. Um, you really do. And if you have the book, it's a lot easier, a lot easier. So uh, I, I can understand people not uh, not being able to grasp some of the things being said. Uh, I, I'm... Isabel's doing an amazing job <laughs> to uh, allow people to grasp anything because it really gets into some deep stuff. And uh, there is further study available uh, if if people want to go further with this. Uh, you know, Bahanu or Isabel may want to recommend some books, but uh, that would of course derail this book, and it and it would end up being an, an endless discussion if we re- really go into the into the details. One thing I've, one thing I've realized in the last few, two, two three months, because I've, I've started reading some of the other material, there is a lot of stuff dealing with this, the, with these subjects. A lot of stuff. Okay, and it's not all in this book. It, it's, it's a very, very deep gold mine that we're uh, just entering into the. Be- into the lip of the mind here, uh, it goes much deeper. Mike is free. I just wanted to mention that if anyone uh, does need a, any at any point to clarify something or slow it down, that's okay. 
to type something in the room asking, can you slow down or can you explain that or, or can you go over that again. That's, that's fine to do that in the text of the room. Please do that. We don't want to, you know, like Bruce, uh, who was Adams, I'd get in the passing lane and, 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 and all that. And, and, and it's, it's just, the point of this is we do want, um, we do want, our, our motivation here is to try to share good information, help people to grow closer to God. It's not to say, oh, we did a class, yay, you know. Um, so please, uh, please, at any point, just type in the room, can you go over that again, or whatever you need done. That, that's absolutely fine, and, and we appreciate that. And there's probably more than one person thinking the same thing you're thinking, whoever that may be. <laughs> At the end, it will probably be, probably have five other people going, oh, thank goodness, they're going over it again. So so please do that. Um, and uh, questions are good. Type questions in the room. Just keep them, you know, try to keep them short to the point so that we can address, like, one point at a time and, and, and keep going. So hand the mic over to Jackie, then we can start up again. One of the things I'm getting out of the book, I haven't been to the room that often, but I am listening to the teaching, is one of the things I'm getting out of the book is, man, his principles are everlasting. His principles are never ending. And this is what I think that Ram Kel wanted to bring forth was the principles. These are the principles of how you can have a relationship with him. These are the principles by which you live by so you can have a good relationship with others. These principles and that when things happen bad to me, to me they might be bad, but to the end it's for my good. This is a concept that I had a hard time with. To know that, gee, when something bad happens to me, it's really for my good. Mm. But you know what? It's true. That sometimes the things that we have to go through mentally to bring us closer to Him is for our good. Always has been. Okay, can everybody hear me? Okay, let me see if I can articulate this correctly and appropriately. I am like practically brand new to Torah and I don't even understand a lot of the basics yet. And I have the book for this class. It came like this, I think it was the second time we met or after the second time. And I have not had a chance to start reading it yet because I'm in college, so I have no time. But my question is, um, it seems to me anyway to be like really tough meat for me. It's on such a deep level and it seems like there's a lot of tradition and I don't even know what Kabbalah is and a lot of stuff that seems like it's not necessarily scriptural. I, I'm, not, I'm not saying that it is or it isn't, but I'm having a hard time grasping a lot of it, and I'm wondering why it is that you have to read the book in order to get anything out of what's being discussed in the class, in the room. That's my main question. Um, a couple of the things I was going to take in... I have another example about forces and one from scripture if that might help a little bit more in that regards. But one of the things that I had when I began to study Torah is I had a sense of, um, I guess there was not a lot of direction. I would like a synopsis of, of understanding of concepts and ideas and somebody to piece these different concepts that underlie Torah. And one of the things that I will say, and I don't want to be offensive to anybody, but this Torah was given to a group of people, a specific group of people who were given a mission and held accountable to that mission, and that was to take this word, to live, to to be a parable in the world, to serve Hashem, to, to, to increase God's light, and by doing so, attract others to God as well. But not that the Torah is only for Israel, but the, those people who, this is the path for 
this is the path. This is the way that God relates. And you can't, not that you can't relate to God if you don't have Torah in your life. God, you know, it's what level do you want to connect to Hashem. That being said, there are principles, there are understandings, there are methods of, 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 of reading and evaluating the scriptures that are unique to Judaism. And not because the, not because of different mindset, but just the principles and the approach and the concepts behind the words. Um, and so what the Ram Call is doing is he's he's talking to a group of people in his time. There's a great deal of change going on in the Jewish community. There are a lot of people that are starting to fall away and enter into a more secular lifestyle. For the first time, Jews are being accepted into different realms, banking and other institutions, and they're starting to turn away from Judaism. So he's trying to give a clear presentation to the people in his community and to the greater Jewish community saying, hey, there are beautiful concepts contained within the Torah. If you understand those concepts, then you'll be able to um, understand the book itself. And as a result of this, you will take and um, be able to apply the Torah to a very practical way to your own life. And so when you're starting out in a system, if you're starting out in an understanding, not that you have to believe what the wrong call is saying, not that you have to take and look at the Jewish traditions and every teaching contained within them and make them into your belief system, but I believe there's a great value to understand those concepts, to understand where these, this community, this body of people, and this, this body of, of knowledge is coming from. And by doing so, you'll have concepts that you may relate to Scripture differently. Um, and I'm not saying every every tradition is correct and true, that the ultimately the guide and the, and the gauge of its correctness is the Torah itself and the scriptures that we were given. And so, um, as a result of these concepts, when you're beginning in a new system, having a really firm foundation and understanding, and you're being in college, you know, <laughs> understand all the money that you pay for those 101 classes, we need a 102 and 202 or what, and, and so that is, that's what the Ram Call is attempting to do in his book. Now when we get into some of the more abstract concepts such as the spiritual realm, it's really difficult because these, these are using, um, these are using language. This is, this is a, this is a, a non-physical reality and we're using physical terminology because that's the only way we can relate to it because we live, exist, breathe, eat, sleep, physical, material existence. So these concepts are really difficult. Forces and angels and spiritual beings that have no space and no time. They don't think linearly. There's the, the idea of, 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 um, cause and effect is very different in the spiritual realm than in our own existence. And so, and, and so I think when people, um, I know that I've encountered many Messianics and many Christians and also many Jews and myself, you, I think everybody has an area where you close your mind off and say, okay, no, I'm not even going to listen to that concept. But when you open your mind to different ideas, it doesn't mean that you have to accept them. It just means that you're exploring them and ultimately, again, using the Torah as your gauge to, to see, okay, well, this is, this is what the wrong call is saying. Based on your understanding of scripture, does it, does it mesh? So that's always, that's, that's what you're required to do. It's, it's, it's our, it's the reason that God gave us an intellect. And, in utilizing that in the service of God, you will gain enlightenment. It's, you're gonna make mistakes, you're gonna have false conclusions, and there's nobody that is not going to have, that is going to have 100% clarity and have absolutely no false ideas or belief systems. But the fact that we try is all that God asks from us. And He, get, he provides the assistance and the enlightenment along the way, God willing, so. Yeah, from, <clears throat> to me, and this, hopefully this, uh, example will kind of clarify what I think is the value of stuff like this. How many of you have read a book and then later watched a really good movie about that book? In other words, maybe it's The Matrix, maybe it's Lord of the Rings, maybe it's a Christmas story. You know, you read the book and then you see a good movie, a well-made movie. If what you see in the movie, you see there's background. There's there's a vistas. There's 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 a setting. There's things that you can see in the movie that you never saw in the book. The book was limited. You were limited in having to imagine things in, from reading the book. But when you saw it made into a movie, suddenly it was much more understandable. Suddenly, the things that were described in the book 
are now illustrated and seen in the movie. It makes the grasp of the story so much better. To me, that's that's largely what this does. Is we read scripture, it's it's great stuff, it's good stuff. We read story, we read Torah, it's outstanding, but we're reading it. This is like suddenly a movie is being made of it. Suddenly, the the things in the background you can see. You can see characters in the background that were there in the book, but not necessarily described. You, it, it, I'm, I'm having a hard time explaining it, but but. What this does, in my opinion, this, this type of study, the study of a Kabbalistic thought, which is, which is Torah commentary, is what it is, Torah teaching, it provides a background. It provides a vista. It provides a, a clearer stage on which all of this plays out, the entirety of creation. It provides what the, the book could not provide. It provides a sight, in a sense, as, uh, almost like you're seeing now something that you could not see. Um, that's the way this works with me. And the other, as I've studied this and, and other things, it's, the more I study it, the clearer the picture becomes. And the book is still there, and nothing is differing, is, is differing from the book. It's just there's now more to see. The scene is now in in actually being seen in the movie. You don't just have a script. You now have an actual scene of action. If you, if you can grasp what I'm what I mean here, and you probably didn't because I did a poor job. <laughs> Mike is free. I think I'm understanding what you're saying, Bruce. It's like this: I can read the Torah day in and day out. This book is like a movie to me about what I'm reading day in and day out. It brings in what was hidden in the pages that I'm reading. This book has brought in what was hidden so I could understand what I read. Instead of going to everybody and their brother... What does this mean? What does this mean? What does this mean? What does this mean? This book has enlightened so much that I can now pick up the Torah and I can go, wow, I've seen the movie. <laughs> because he brings it in such a way that the principles are right there. Real life people. <laughs> real life people they're not make believe stories and what he does is he brings the movie to you so when you're reading the book what we call the bible all of a sudden the book comes alive to us because of what this man's work has done and that's how I look at it. That this book, Direct Hashem, is like a movie of the Torah that we read every day. He brings it to life. At least that's what he's done for me. He's brought it to life to where I can see not only here. Um... So, one of the things that I wanted to end with in the concept of the forces and the indeterminate meaning, us directing towards God and God directing towards us, the, the greatest living example, well, not in our eye, our time, but the greatest example from the Torah is the um, sacrificial system. And as a result of the sacrificial system, that you are... God doesn't need these sacrifices. He he requires them, and you ask why. They are influencing. They are influencing these for, these forces. On one of the holiest days of the year, Yom Kippur, you have an a, an, a goat going out, and it's for Azazel. 
it's for one of these forces to placate them. And so the, you have a whole system of sacrifices and offerings being continually done in Israel when they were when the temple was standing and um it influencing the spiritual forces above but it's also got the spiritual forces having an influence downwards as well because if Israel did the sacrificial system with proper intent with with kavana with to to connect to God through faith then then the forces would would draw down that would come down to Israel in a very pure way, in a very holy way, would affect them um, through forgiveness, through uh, placating of God's justice and giving and mercy. And you see that through like the, um, the Yom Kippur sacrifice, that if um, the goat was chased into the wilderness and pushed off a cliff, that they, their sins would be forgiven, that they play literally placing the sins of Israel upon the head of this goat to Azazel, and they're chasing them out to the, to the wilderness. And so the forces play a part there in the sacrificial system, and they're not, they're not gods themselves, though a lot of, um, a lot of people worship the forces as gods that they are they are only agents and messengers of Hashem serving his will and um as a result of these of these sacrifices and offerings that Israel would give and bring to Hashem then um they would be there would be real consequences both good and bad for them um based upon their action now, ultimately, it's not the sacrifices and offerings that God desires, but it's the service of your heart. But they were still necessary because these forces had an influence in the land, an influence in Israel, because Israel made a huge error in the sin of the golden calf. They were left with a basically a spiritual chink in the armor that was passed on from person to person. And as a result, you see when Israel is in the process of forming this golden calf, um, that God's giving them the remedy, and that is the sacrificial system, the temple, and the priesthood, and sacrifices to placate these forces that would now be directed against them. And so, if you think that um, there's another really important concept, and in, in, in regard to the forces and the spiritual realm, is and it's unique. What is the word for for um, pure? In Hebrew, is tahor. Now, what's the word in English for in? For if you're not pure, it's impure. There's no specific word in English that you know, or in other languages that means impurity. But in is in in um, Judaism, there's a word. I mean, in Hebrew, it's tame, and it's literally. It's not that you're dirty physically. It's spiritual contamination. It's spiritual impurity. And so these concepts are very important because to be tahor or tame really means that you are, it's your spiritual standing, it's, it's the condition of your soul. And so God has implemented different mechanisms in our, in, through Torah and in, um, in scripture and also in tradition to deal with these, these processes of tahor and tame, pure and impure. And that is a result, again, of the forces in the spiritual realm because these are spiritual concepts. They don't have a physical um, physical counterpart, though your physical actions can cause you to become pure or impure, but, um, you, but it's not your physical body that you're polluting. It's, it's your spiritual self. It's your soul. And it's also the um, items can become pure or impure as well. And so um, these are very important concepts that the spiritual impurity can spread throughout the whole of the whole of the people. I know that I think that Taz said earlier about you know Israel is one. There's a concept that comes later in the book that ultimately mankind is bound together. That we all have influences. We all are um, we're all in this boat together, and the actions can affect good or bad. The the rest. You know. I don't know if that was helpful for the forces, but just to go back with the understanding of forces and read. Go read, the, especially the Yom Kippur sacrifice, and, and think about the forces in the angelic realm and the spiritual realm and how God um, commanded Israel and the various actions they were to take that day. So it gives you a different perspective when you do that. Um, if you have any questions or comments on that, if not, I can just read just a little bit of section... Four, and that will probably bring us right to the end. 
Um, so we were in age 81 towards um, getting into five, I think. Or did I finish five? No, nope, I'm sorry, I did finish five. Um, every indeterministic influence, however, also results in deterministic influences. When the highest forces are influenced by man's free will, they in turn influence the physical things that are inherently linked to them. All these processes, however, follow many detailed laws as decreed by the highest wisdom as being best for creation. Both the ways through which man's influence reaches the highest forces and the manner in which these forces react towards the physical world all depend on many factors. All this constitutes the deep mystery of how God's providence works and brings about everything that was and will be. And that's a concept I'd really like to talk about, which is Hashem's God's providence for the world, but it's really... Um, it's it's really a broad concept, and he does bring it up a little bit later in the book. Um, but in regards to this, that it, if you look at the body of the Torah and you look at how many commandments of the Torah focus on the sacrificial system and and um, commandments regarding pure and impure and dealing with those things, touching a dead body, um, becoming you know physically impure there's a whole concept of um, it's pr it's translated as leprosy but it's really not leprosy it's um, um, saras it's uh, it's a it's basically a physical manifestation of your spiritual con condition so there's these concepts that God like I said, that God has placed in our reality to show the physical our spiritual condition so when you look at the idea of this Zaras and, and the, the um, sacrificial system and uh, the, the um, ashes of the red heifer being sprinkled on people for, to become their, their impure, to become pure, and the different um, high holy days in regards to the service in the temple, a lot of these things don't exist right now and, are, and they're not a reality. Um, I'm sorry, I was on page 82. 80, 80, 83, my apologies, I, I skipped ahead. I read further along than I thought. But getting back to that, that there's a reality um, that doesn't exist. There, there, there's no temple, there's no priesthood. These sacrificial systems which are, which are implemented by God to deal with real conditions of Israel, real spiritual conditions of Israel, don't exist. Now, now that's not being said that we're stranded along the road um, the, the prophets talk about a time period where this would be a reality but they're very important and we do know if you read in, in, in the different prophets like Ezekiel you'll see that this this the systems do come back um, but um, it's a majority of the, t of the Torah I mean there's a huge body of commandments related to this whole dealing with these forces dealing with the concepts of spiritual impurity um, how to stop the spiritual impurity from spreading within the camp and you know you have God, God giving you warnings of you know Israel. You know, if you're sinning and you're sinning in secret, God's going to give you warnings. They're going to put this a mark on your on your house. He'll put a mark on your clothing. He'll put a mark on you. Um, the, there's an understanding in Judaism that Israel has sunk to such a low level that even those spiritual warning signs that are manifested in real in, in the physical realm don't exist anymore. And if you read and you follow the ultimate curse of of Torah for disobedience is not necessarily dying it's, it's, it's being cut off it's being it's debasing yourself being cut off from the spiritual realm to such a point that you don't even know what you're doing anymore you, you have a complete disconnect between your physical actions and the spiritual realm and the spiritual consequences and so it's really important to understand the physical as it relates to the spiritual and um, and that's why the Torah really is devote such an enormous amount of space to this concept because this is something that Israel, that the physical world just doesn't comprehend because we don't live in that spiritual realm. And so while we cannot, while we ne may not necessarily be able to bring sacrifices and offerings and do these things, understanding the concepts and the reasons why is very important because those haven't passed away. Um, let's see here. And so the deep mystery is, you know, one of the deepest mysteries, and, I, and there's a midrash on it as well, is how can you take the 
the the person who does the ashes of the red heifer. You, it makes one person clean, the person who sprinkled, but it takes the, it makes the other person unclean. And so there's a lot of deep mysteries and understandings that don't necessarily have a physical connection, a physical reason in our in our in our understanding, but there are real spiritual consequences and ideas behind them. So I am I'd like to leave it off here. Um and leave it open for discussion and everything. So, again, thank you so much. Yeah, I just want to emphasize, if, you, if you're taking an, a, cla a math class, algebra, calculus, if you're taking a history class, if you're taking a class on world literature, anytime you're studying anything, you generally always must read the book. And I don't mean to sound like a teacher or, or, or a principal here with a little ruler slapping the wrist, but this is a study. This is not the kind of thing you can listen to casually and grasp it. You're not going to. Like anything that's worthwhile, honestly, you really it's something you study. I think a lot of this comes from maybe some uh, traditional Christian um habits that we we picked up at time where people will go to church and listen to the preacher and oftentimes those people hardly ever open their Bible just sits collecting dust and they never really learn what the Bible teaches because they're listening they're thinking that somebody can speak it into their brain this honestly is something you're going to have to study again what is more of, of more valuable than the study of the Torah than the study of the word of the God of God Nothing's more valuable. So if, if we if we study our calculus, if we study our our world literature, if we study our our geography, if we study our history, we also need to study scripture and commentary. So honestly, in all honesty, and I'm and I'm not saying this as chastisement, but a lot of people have difficulty understanding this is a study. This is not a casual discussion, and it it's assumed that people who are participating look upon this seriously, look upon it seriously as in, as in wanting to draw closer to Hashem, the Most High God, wanting to understand the way of God more closely, wanting, wanting to draw close to God. And, and the study, if you read uh, Jude Judaic literature, one thing you constantly see, and I fully em em embrace this, is the focus on Study, study, study. Study is considered one of the highest forms of worship of God. Do you realize that? The study of the Word of God, study of the Word of God is considered about the highest form of worship for God. Because why? It takes effort. It takes effort. There the action from above is initiated by action from below. It's a reaction to our, to our action. Our action is to seek to draw close to God through study. His reaction is to rain blessings down from on high. So uh, I just want to emphasize again, for those of you who do not have the book, this is not a casual discussion. This is not a casual pal talk chat room. You, we're, you really need to go through the book just as you would your calculus book or your algebra book or your physics or chemistry book. You're not going to understand physics or chemistry if you never crack the book. You're going to fail out. You're going to flunk out of the course. Well, you're not going to understand the way of God if you never crack the book. And uh, it's just that simple. And, and you know, hopefully, once you people begin reading it, you'll you'll begin to grasp it uh, more really. Mike is free. Can I be heard, please? I was on the mic. I don't know what happened. <laughs> I thought I was speaking, but... Uh, but anyway, um, this is... Uh, actually, I have two questions. One is... Um, I'm not sure if I understood correct. Uh, um, Isabel, um, um, did God make 
made um, a spiritual beings for everything he has, including us. Do we have each of us, each individual, all of us have uh, an a spiritual, another spiritual being, if you want to call it uh, angels or whatever, um, that helps us. This is one question, and the next question is this. My understanding from uh, uh, the New Testament and, and Old Testament, obviously both, is that um, if we are connected to um, Elohim, and uh, obviously because to, to in order to be connected to Elohim we need to have uh, the spiritual connection because we can't uh, physically it's not possible it's, it's all about spirit um, so because of our connection and because we are following his uh, instru uh, uh, instructions and, and laws and regulations that will have uh, uh, reflection in our uh, behaviors, in our physical abilities, and so on and so forth, right? So this is two questions. Actually, I have three questions. The third question, if it is relevant, if it is not, that's all right. How does, uh, how does it work when we follow God, when we are obeying God and uh, as you know most of the commandment is to do good to others for the most part I don't know how many commandments that we've heard that it is about me myself alone right it always says that I don't know thou shall not kill and, and thou shall not lie and so on and so forth obviously it is referring to other people what our action uh, supposed to be uh, supposed to manifest it towards other people how does this affect me in per me my, my, as a person you know what I mean um, by following God and doing good to others how does this benefit my soul and my spirit and my well being you know thank you so uh, too many questions. Oops, sorry, can you hear me? Um, well, there's, there's one answer in some of them that our function in this world is to emulate our Creator. That um, to draw close to God, we have to be able to transcend this realm, this physical realm, and that true closeness comes, not physically. There's no place you can move in this world to get closer to God, um, but that it's meant to be a, a spiritual closeness. And so that draws back to the really important concept that something to be spiritually close is to be to resemble. It's to re the closer the resemblance, the closer the spiritual. Um, the closer they are spiritually and so how we cling to God is by emulating our creator by by, by trying to um, I'm trying to say how to word this I have it in my notes <laughs> a little bit better than I can um that we are to be imitators of God in this world, that we are to take his attributes and his commandments and by fulfilling them, by by functioning and doing what God requires of, of us in this world by emulating God's attributes of chesed, his kindness, his mercy. And there's, this, there's one of the prophets that says, what does God require of you? He says to do justice, to love mercy, to walk humbly with God, to do all these things. And by by emulating the, the love and the patience and and um, these general concepts been carrying them out specifically by following the Torah commandments to um, return lost objects um, to you know don't lead a blind man astray how to deal with your neighbor in disputes how to how to manage your property so people don't get hurt these these specific commandments are all tied to general concepts to general ideas to general attributes that God has 
And so these specific commandments have an underlying attribute that God is merciful, God is just, God is patient, he's loving, kind. And so by emulating these attributes, by carrying them out, by making them manifest in our world through actual physical acts, not just not just agreeing in your mind, oh yeah, God's love and I'm going to be loved, but actually doing those things, um, being patient with your neighbor or your child or your husband and, and, and doing, doing zadaka, giving charity to groups and to give of yourself and your time, to use your possessions in a way that blesses others. Not that you're going to totally, you know, you know, give yourself away of house and home, but to, to do that in this world, that's how you become spiritually close to God by emulating Him to be, to be, um, imitators of God. So Shalom, thank you so much for coming. And so as a result of this, these actions that you're taking upon and you are the vehicle through which God interacts in this realm that you and I and and all of mankind is the primary vehicle by which God influences and deals with others in this realm yeah there are spiritual forces that come into play at times and you see them bringing judgments but most of the part if God wants to help another person he uses God wants to bless so and so he uses another person um, and that is an important idea that you can be that agent on behalf of God as well. Um, and by dealing with your own self, by, by, by conforming to God's image that he's laid out for us in his commandments, and what he's revealed of who who God is and these attributes that are revealed in scripture by emulating them in yourself then you have you have greater spiritual um sensitivity to be used even to a greater degree by God in other matters so okay, uh, Mike is free yeah Isabel I think I understand a little bit more uh, a couple of years ago I was volunteering at a at a place and there's a lot of unkindness going on and the last couple of years if I'm around unkindness a lot I get physically ill and mentally incapacitated so I did a search on kindness and there's a World Kindness Day and also in this information scientists have studied kindness and there's great health benefits so I tell people kindness is healthy and if kindness is healthy what's unkindness? It's unhealthy for the giver and the receiver. So I, I see the connection there, and it, it, it's it's really neat. Thank you. I'm on a different uh, concept. Um, I don't think that somebody correcting someone is unkind. I mean, I don't think that that uh, that Hashem was being unkind when he corrected Israel. I think he loved Israel. I think he wanted Israel to love him. But Israel didn't want to love him at first. I guess when I read um, in the prophets where it says that if, if Daniel and Job and Noah or in the day of pestilence and famine and sword. They would be saved by their own righteousness. They wouldn't be able to save their children. But they would be able to save themselves. Why? Those three men walked with their God. And they knew Him as He knew them. So, to me... And God is closer to me than my very breath. If I do not feel close to God, it's because my relationship with Him has become long distance. And I need to bring it back to being close. You can have a long distance with re- you can have a long distance relationship with a person, and you can love that person. But sooner or later, the distance it's not going to make you more fond because what you're going to do is you're going to try and look for someone that's closer and that's why if we keep God close to us then God will keep us close to him and that's just my concept okay now 
I was having problem. I don't know. Pal talk is giving me really a lot of problem. Can I be heard now? All right. Um, Isabel, I'm just uh, okay. I'm reading what uh, what you have in text for me. Um, a lack of spiritual connect could literally cutting us off from Hashem and the person skinning can you explain this I'm not understand it, uh, understanding this I'm sorry if you don't mind um, explaining me in verbally I understand more sometimes than especially when certain deep uh, conversation is going on um uh, while while we are at it, um, I'm going to repeat the second uh, que- or the third question. What benefit do we get when we obey God and do good to others? Do you see what I'm saying? Uh, because again, um, if you look at the Torah. Most, actually almost all of it is for other people. The laws are referred to be applied towards other people. For instance, to love your neighbor, do not lie, do not cheat, don't commit adultery. It's always referred to other person or to other persons. Uh, how do we benefit from following the laws and doing good to other people only? What about us? Do you understand what I'm saying? I hope you understand. Thank you. Um, I'm going to go back to a couple of the notes and then I'll comment on them. When I was going through and trying to do a synopsis of the whole class, um, I'll read a couple of my notes again my apologies for who um, for everyone who heard it before uh, I was talking I don't know if you heard the notes about closeness not being a physical concept it's a, it's a spiritual concept and if you think about it like it's, it's mirrored in our own lives when you, know, if you have two people say a husband and wife who are angry at each other they can be sitting side by side but they can be said to be distant meaning that you can be physically close but emotionally disconnected from each other. And so using this this, sim- this symbolism, uh, building on that concept, that we know that being close to God physically is not what the point of it is. It's spiritual closeness. And so we have this, the Torah says that you should, f- you should follow the Lord your God to fear him and keep his commandments, obey him and serve him, and bind yourself to him. So we talked about in, in the review that the ultimate good that God wants to give to us isn't isn't stuff. It is it's a portion of Himself. It's a it's a connection. It's Himself. God wants to give us Him a relationship with Him. And so, how do we do this? What does this clinging to God mean? Binding yourself to God. Um, in this, the the question in the Talmud is in the Sota it says, how can one bind himself to God? For the Lord your God is a consuming fire. And the answer is, we bind ourselves to Hashem by imitating His attributes. So in a spiritual sense, we become resemble our Creator. How do we do that? By emulating those attributes. Now, being internally focused and thinking of ourselves, how do you do this? How do you resemble the attributes of God? Well, God created, He made creation. The fact that we're talking about God right now, that we're studying Him right now, means that God created his whole point was a relationship. So many of the commandments that we have are relationship commandments, how we relate to God, how we relate to people. They all are, basically. It's not you're going to sit on a mountaintop and empty your mind of all thought and deed until you become one with the universe. That's not the point. We're here to relate. We're here to relate to God. We're here to relate to each other. And so when you look at the Torah, it's not about internal. You change yourself 
by emulating your creator, and you emulate your creator by relating to the un to the world around you in the proper fashion, not disconnecting. There's a lot of religious systems says the only way to become holy is to disconnect from the world, to to deny yourself any type of worldly pleasures, and to completely divorce yourself from the physical and and become spiritually minded. And that is the that is an anathema. That's the opposite of what Judaism and Torah says. No. Being involved with creation is, in, is, a, is, is, is the point. Being involved with creation in the correct way, connecting to the people around you, connecting to God who created you is the whole point you're here. And as a result, the mechanism we are to do that in the realm of, of carrying this, this, commit, this purpose out is the physical world. And so... How do we emulate our Creator who is loving? Well, the Torah says, you know, I'm merciful, so you're going to be merciful. You're going to you're going to take care of the poor. You're going to take care of the widow. You're going to have you're going to give special consideration to to the um, the disadvantaged amongst your ranks. You're not going to you're not going to look at a convert who has no family and, dis and, and, and mistreat him. So those are like some of the examples in how we we emulate God. Those are practical ways. These are concepts, but they have but they're required to be implemented in our lives in real, practical ways. Now, by doing this, by doing these actions, by carrying and, and making these attributes of God an integral part of our life, now we become spiritually close. We're resembling God to a greater degree. The more that we do, the greater we resemble God, the closer we become spiritually. That is the process of binding yourself to God, and that's how you receive the good in this world. But the good that you receive in this world is very limited, and... The ultimate reward is this world to come. This is Olam Hazeh, and we have Olam Haba, the world to come, and that is the world of reward. So all the good deeds, all of this, all of the actions that we do in this world have consequences in the spiritual realm. But because we live in this physical world, and our soul is basically a prisoner kept away from our true self, all of this spiritual energy that we create in this world doesn't reach its full potential until the world to come. And that's the world of reward and benefit and consequences for what we've done in this world. So a lot of the actions in this world seem to have a disconnect. We do good. We don't necessarily see any results of it. We, we plug away trying to serve God and bad things seem to happen. You know, you, you're, trying to, you're trying to do something good for your neighbor and, you, and your car won't start. All of these actions are, are there for a reason, but we don't necessarily see why. So... The only thing we can do is have faith in God through serving him, that he's, he is ultimately a rewarder of those who faithfully serve him. And he promises that in Scripture time and time again. Because of the reality of this world is we don't always see the consequences, good or bad, of our actions. And this is the world of striving. This is the world of, of um, struggle. And as a result, it may not, you may not get the results that you would expect. And sometimes even people who you would think should have have an easier life or you know have have good things happen to them the, then all the psalms are fr are full of why do the <laughs> why are the why are the wicked you know driving a BMW and making 50 million dollars a year while these while there are people who do a great deal of good they you know they can barely get enough food for their family why do these things happen and that is the whole concept of reward and punishment in the spiritual realm and that is where we ultimately will see the rewards and benefits of our actions. So I don't know if that helped. I think many that do wickedness to receive the the, uh, the big cars and things like that, if they got it by wickedness, they have their rewards. Um, oh, okay, Bronca, I wasn't I wasn't understanding what you were typing. I apologize. Um, to me, if you can stop if you can that's because everybody tells me I have a loud voice so I I've got my mic completely over on the end of my desk so I apologize I'll just have to speak louder now <coughs> I got tired of people telling me I'm yelling I have a voice that carries you could be six houses down the road and if it was time for dinner I could go outside and I could call your name and I wouldn't have to scream your name, I could call your name and the next door neighbor would think I was screaming at you. My voice carries. It just does. Um, yeah, Isabel, I wasn't talking about a physical relationship. 
I was talking about a spiritual relationship. Can't have a physical relationship with God. But I can't have a spiritual relationship with Him. It's just like when my husband went to Iraq and I was here in the United States. I was closer to my husband when he was there than when he was here. Why? Physically, he was here. But when he was not here physically, spiritually, he was on my mind constantly, day in and day out. And I was on his mind constantly, day in and day out. Is he okay? Is everything going okay with him? Is he pleased? Am I doing what he would want me to do while he's gone? Am I doing what would be right, me being the head of the house right now, since he's not here? Am I doing things that he would approve of? Constantly. This is the relationship that I wanted with God. Am I doing things that are pleasing unto you? I've corrected my child. Would you have corrected them? I corrected my child because I love them and I don't want them going down a road that's going to cause them more punishment than what they could get right now. This is how I have built my relationship with God. I acknowledge Him in all my ways, not just in some of them. When I'm angry, I acknowledge Him. Why am I angry? Why am I angry? Why why did you let me be involved in something like this? You knew it was going to make me angry. And it would be to teach you, to show you. You see, I look at it as as when, when is, Israel was moving across the land, that, that God was watching them and God was seeing what they were doing and he knew what direction they were going to go into and he didn't want them to go in that direction. So what did he do? It's like he put a big, huge brick in front of them called a prophet and the prophet stood there and then the brick spoke and, and the prophet said, turn or this will befall you. Did they like hearing the words of the prophet? No, they didn't. Were the words of the prophet kind and gentle and sweet? No, they weren't. But did the words of the prophet turn them? If it did, then what anything was, you know, because the prophet will always do, turn or this, turn or this, turn or this. And if they turn then this never happened. And if they didn't turn, then that happened. That's how I look at our relationship with, with, uh, with God, is that when you're going to do something, He's going to put something in front of you saying, don't. But if you decide to do it, then you must own up to what you have done, and you must teshuva, exactly, Bracha. You cannot have excuses for it. You cannot say, but, 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 but. Because you knew, you did it anyway, and now you want to blame somebody else for what you've done. Many times we've gone through things that we really had nothing to do with, and yet, for me, they were for a teaching experience. Oh, I'm sorry, I thought I was speaking to her. Oh, well. <laughs> 